Hi everyone! Welcome to How to Play Cuisine a la Carte. My name is Danny. I'm the designer of the game, and in this video, I'm going to teach you everything you need to learn to play this culinary deck builder and become a tabletop gourmet. In cuisine, you are a budding chef competing against your opponents on a wild cooking show where you'll have to buy up whatever ingredients you think you can use, put them together in whatever combination you can think of, and submit your assembled dish to the panel of judges who will rate your creation and award you medals based on their individual tastes. And at the end of the game, whoever has the most medals is the winner. The game supports two to four players and plays in about half an hour. And don't worry, it's a very easy game to pick up and play. In fact, I've already given you all the basics. So let me show you how to set the game up and then we can really get cooking. The first thing you'll want to do is deal each player their starting cards. Each player begins the game with a reference card. On one side is a list of actions a player can take on their turn, and on the other side is a list of all the symbols in the game and their meanings. Next, give each player their starting deck. This consists of 10 cards, 8 tasting spoons, and 2 finishing salts. Tasting spoons are tool cards. Tools are the currency you will use to purchase ingredients throughout the game. Speaking of which, your first two ingredients are right here, finishing salts. These are unique ingredients with special abilities designed to help you early in the game. More on that in a bit. For now, however, each player should shuffle their starting 10 cards together, deal themselves 5 to form their starting hand, and set the other 5 aside to form their starting deck. Next, we'll move on to setting up the ingredient marketplace. First, take all of the non-salt ingredient cards in the game and shuffle them together. Place them in a face-down stack at one end of the play area. This is the pantry, and it's full of over 100 ingredient cards for you to work with. Now, coming out of the pantry is a constantly moving conveyor belt with four slots on it. This is the marketplace, and it pulls new ingredients out of the pantry every turn. So let's reveal our first four ingredients. We have tortilla, bok choy, mozzarella, and escargot. Next, gather all the fork cards in the game and place them at the end of the marketplace. Forks are an advanced currency in the game used to purchase expensive ingredients like our escargot here or to gain additional purchase actions during a player's turn. Players do not begin with any forks. They must be purchased from the marketplace here. Luckily, they're not on the conveyor and are always available. Now, with the marketplace in order, it's time to assemble our panel of judges. To assemble the judge's table, gather all the judge cards and separate them based on their meal point requirements listed here. You'll have three stacks, 15, 18, and 21 point judges. Shuffle each of these stacks and place them face down at the end of the marketplace where all players can easily see them. Turn over the top card of each stack to reveal the starting judges. We have little Leonardo, Princess Priscilla, and celebrity chef Sammy. Finally, take all your medal tokens and place them in a pile near the judges so that they can be awarded when the judges are scored. Medals are your victory points in the game. Gold medals are worth one point, and blue medals are worth five. So with our starting deck, the marketplace, and our judges all in place, our setup is done and we're ready to play. So let's get started. During the game, players take turns buying ingredients from the marketplace in order to build their dishes. In between each turn, the marketplace conveyor is going to move changing what ingredients are available for sale each turn. The player who goes first is whoever has cooked most recently. I made some great soup last night, so I'll buy from the marketplace first. Now, normally, players play the game with their hands kept hidden, but I'm going to lay my hand out so you can see what it is I'm doing. So, I have a handful of tasting spoons, which means I can buy almost anything I want from the marketplace. But before I do, let's take a closer look at the ingredients on offer and see what it is we're buying. Each ingredient card has its cost listed here in the upper right corner. As you can see, most ingredients cost spoons, but some ingredients can only be purchased with forks. 
As a rule, if your starting marketplace has more than one fork card ingredient in it, you may shuffle the marketplace back into the pantry and redraw. But since we only have one, we're good. Now, in the opposite corner of each card, we have these little chef hat icons. These are the ingredients meal point value. As you can see, mozzarella, bok choy, and tortilla are each worth two meal points, while escargot is worth five. Your goal when submitting a dish to a judge is to add up all your ingredients' meal points to meet or exceed that judge's meal point requirement. And if you remember, judges come in 15, 18, and 21 point categories. So even if we were able to buy up all these ingredients and make a bok choy escargot mozzarella quesadilla, we'd still only have an 11 point meal on our hands, so we have a little way to go yet. Now, in addition to being worth meal points, ingredients also have abilities that can aid you as a chef. Down at the bottom of the cards, you can see that each ingredient has two spaces for abilities. Each ability that's printed on the card has a symbol right next to it, telling you when to activate it. For example, this little card icon means to activate the ability when you play that card from your hand during your turn. So I can use mozzarella to gain an additional tasting spoon during my turn for added purchasing power. The little cloche icon means I can activate that ability when that ingredient is submitted as part of a dish. For example, when I submit a dish including tortilla, I can draw an extra card from my deck and possibly sneak an additional ingredient into my meal. If an ability has multiple icons, like tortillas does, it means I can use the ability in either way, depending on what I'm doing that turn. Now, I mentioned that each ingredient has two spaces for abilities. The top white space ability is the card's default ability and can be activated anytime you perform the triggering action. The bottom ability in this colored space is the card's cuisine type ability and can only be activated when you perform the triggering action with another ingredient of the same color. There are four cuisine types in the game. French cuisine, Italian cuisine, Pan-Asian cuisine, and Western cuisine. And these are all sort of culinary regions or factions that have flavors that pair well together. You can tell what cuisine type an ingredient is by looking at the color of the border as well as the symbol here in the bottom corner. So, when I play two cards of the same color together, I get to activate both of their cuisine type abilities. Sometimes, these abilities are to do things like draw or discard cards. Other times, these abilities grant the ingredient bonus meal points for being played with another ingredient of the same faction. For example, bok choy here is only worth two meal points by itself. But if I submit it in a dish with another pan-Asian ingredient, say, Asian pear, both of their abilities would trigger and make the dish worth an additional five meal points between the two cards. So you can begin to see how you can make combos and flavor pairings that really give your dish an edge in submission power. Now, before we go back to our turn, two final notes about cuisine type abilities. First, as long as you have the ingredients, there is no limit to the number of combos you can make in a turn. For example, if I have at least two Italian ingredients, and at least two French ingredients in a dish, I would get to activate all Italian and all French cuisine type abilities for the ingredients in that dish. Second, some ingredients, like saffron here, have gray borders. These are neutral ingredients that can go with almost anything. Most gray ingredients are things such as seasonings, and instead of pairing based on color or cuisine type, these abilities usually combo based on food types and flavor profiles. As you can see on the side of the card here, almost all ingredients have at least one food type or flavor profile associated with them. These symbols indicate what kind of food an ingredient is, such as carb or produce or protein, as well as what kind of flavor that ingredient brings to your dishes, things such as sweet or tart or aromatic. So going back to our bok choy Asian pear combo from before, if I were to add a sprinkling of saffron to that dish, the saffron submission ability would combo off of the sweetness of the Asian pear and raise this dish's meal point value all the way to 17, way better than our escargot quesadilla from before. So, now that we know all about our ingredients, let's go back to the game and play our first turn. As I was saying before, I have five tasting spoons to use to purchase ingredients. However, 
During a turn, each player only has one free buy action, which means they can only purchase one thing per turn by default. Players can gain additional buys, however, through the use of ingredient abilities and fork cards. But for right now, I can only buy one thing, so I think I'll pick up that mozzarella. The way this works is I lay down the tool card or currency I'm spending and take the ingredient from the marketplace and place it directly in my discard pile, which I'm going to start right here. I can't use the abilities of an ingredient on the turn that I buy it. It has to go into the kitchen to get prepared first. Now that my buy action is spent, there's nothing else I can do. So I take my spent currency and anything left unused in my hand and put everything into my discard as well. All those spoons need to go back to the kitchen and get washed. And with that, my turn is over. I'll draw five fresh cards from my deck and then we need to perform the Marketplace cleanup phase. As I mentioned before, the Marketplace is a big conveyor belt. So now that conveyor belt has to move. So all our ingredients are going to slide down as far as they can away from the pantry. If there's an ingredient in this fourth slot, like tortilla here, that ingredient gets dumped off the conveyor and into the fridge. The fridge will be a new pile we start here by turning the tortilla sideways. I'll explain more about the fridge in a moment, but for now, let's slide our bok choy and escargot down as far as they can go. Now we have two empty slots in the marketplace. We refill these by drawing new ingredients from the pantry. And we have baguette and pomegranate. So now play continues to the next player in clockwise order. My opponent would take their turn, and let's say they bought this pomegranate here because it looks like a really good ingredient. They'd take the pomegranate, and we'd clean up the marketplace again. The bok choy would go into the fridge, covering up our tortilla, and then everything would slide down, and we'd reveal our next ingredients. Buttermilk and tomato. And now it's my turn again, but before I take it, let me explain a little bit about the fridge. The fridge represents an extra slot to purchase from in the marketplace. Over time, more and more ingredients are going to be deposited into the fridge so they don't spoil. During your turn, you can always buy the top card in the fridge for just one tasting spoon, regardless of its printed purchase cost. So for example, this bok choy normally costs three spoons to buy, but right now I could buy it for just one. If I were to buy the bok choy, it would reveal the next card down. If I had another buy, I could purchase that ingredient for another spoon, and so on. Even fork ingredients, like this escargot, are discounted to just a single spoon when they're in the fridge. Now, the fridge can be a great way to get expensive ingredients at a discount, but there's a catch. If you look closely at escargot, you'll see that its default ability is an on-purchase ability. Now, we've already talked about on-play and on-submit abilities. On purchase abilities are activated as soon as the ingredient is purchased, but only if it's purchased from the marketplace. If the escargot makes it all the way into the fridge and is bought from there, the ability does not activate, so you may want to consider paying full price for some ingredients. Unfortunately, I don't have the two forks necessary to buy the escargot, so I'm going to have to let it go for now. Looking at my hand, I have two finishing salts, and three tasting spoons to work with. Now, looking at the marketplace, I can already tell that I really want that tomato to go with my previously purchased mozzarella, but I don't have any forks. So the first thing I'm going to do is spend two of my tasting spoons to buy a fork. When I buy a fork, it goes directly into my discard, just like an ingredient. That counts as my one buy action, but I'd really like to pick up an ingredient this turn, too. And while the fork I bought lets me gain an additional buy, I can't use its abilities on the same turn that I buy it, just like an ingredient. So instead, what I'm going to do is use the on-play ability of one of my finishing salts here. To use an on-play ability, I lay the ingredient out on the table, like I would a tasting spoon if I were buying something. The ingredient then remains in play until the end of my turn and the cleanup phase. But in this case, as you can see, the salt's ability says to trash it to gain an additional buy. 
so the salt won't even make it to the cleanup phase because trashing means to remove from the game. This ability is a one-time deal. So I'll set the salt aside and out of the game. But now I have an additional buy available to me. And what I think I'll do is use my last tasting spoon to buy this baguette here. And with that, I'm out of actions. So I take all my cards and I put them in my discard pile. Now I need to draw back up to five cards, but I don't have a deck to draw from anymore. What happens now is I take my discard pile, turn it over, shuffle it, and it now becomes my deck. So now I have a chance to draw all those ingredients that I've purchased and can now use them for their abilities or in a dish. I'll draw five cards from my new deck and we'll clean up the marketplace. So the escargot will go into the fridge, the buttermilk and tomato will slide down, and we'll draw two new ingredients, garlic and rice. So now my opponent would take their turn. Now, as they had previously bought pomegranate, which is a western ingredient, they'd likely want to pick up this buttermilk to pair it with. And let's say they pulled the same salt trick that I did to also buy a fork for themselves to end their turn. And now we'd go to clean up the marketplace again, but the fourth slot is empty since they bought the buttermilk. In this case, nothing would be forced into the fridge as everything would just slide down one slot. Then we draw our one new ingredient, apple. So now it's my turn again. And if you take a look at my hand, you can see that I've got one tasting spoon, one fork, my baguette, my mozzarella, and a finishing salt. Now, in the end, what I'm trying to do is gather at least 15 meal points worth of ingredients in my hand at a time so that I can submit a dish to a judge. As you can see, right now I only have five meal points, so now is a perfect time to introduce the warming tray. At the start of your turn, you can choose to place a card from your hand into your warming tray. Each player has three warming tray slots in front of them. These slots are a way to bank ingredients for later. When you go to submit a dish to a judge, you can use ingredients from both your hand and your warming tray. Placing an ingredient in the warming tray means that you always have it on hand when you're ready to submit a dish, but there are two caveats. First, once an ingredient is placed in the warming tray, you can't take it back out until you use it in a dish or another card's ability lets you do so. You cannot freely withdraw cards from the warming tray. Second, while an ingredient is in the warming tray, you do not have access to any of its on play abilities. So keep those in mind when deciding which ingredients to store for later. So to recap, there are three slots. You can place one ingredient per turn into an empty slot, and that has to be the first thing you do on your turn. And when you go to submit a dish, you can use any or all of the ingredients in your warming tray. Now, for me on this turn, I have two ingredients that have basically the same ability. And I know I want to start building toward making a dish, so I'm going to go ahead and place my mozzarella into one of my warming tray slots. To do this, I lay it face down on its side in front of me. So my mozzarella will stay face down in that slot until I can use it. And if I ever need a reminder as to what I have in my warming tray, I can just lift the side of the card and peek at it. You'll notice that all important information is printed on the side of the card for that very purpose. Now that I've taken my warming tray action, it's time to buy. And with the cards in my hand, I have a few options available to me. I could use my tasting spoon to buy the rice, then use my fork to gain an additional buy, and then play my baguette as a tasting spoon to buy the escargot from the fridge. or. I could use my tasting spoon with the baguette to count as two spoons to buy the garlic. But what I think I'm going to do is simply use my fork to buy the tomato. By now, you're probably starting to get the hang of it. So what I'll do is fast forward a few turns until I'm ready to submit a dish. Okay, so after a few more turns, I've built up my deck and warming tray a bit, and I think I'm ready to submit a dish to a judge. Now, submitting a dish takes your entire turn. You cannot purchase anything on a turn you submit. So when you're ready, you start your turn by declaring that you'd like to submit a dish, which I'll do now. And then you lay out all the ingredients from your hand and warming tray that you'd like to include in your dish. 
from my warming tray, I'm going to use my mozzarella, my tomato, and this garlic. And from my hand, I'm going to add some chicken and my trusty baguette. Now, we tally up all the meal points these ingredients are worth, including any special abilities. So, let's start with the chicken. You can see that it's worth four meal points by default, but because I'm submitting it with other Italian ingredients, it's worth an additional three, bringing it up to seven. Next is baguette, which is worth two. And while I am playing it with a dairy, I don't get to activate its special ability because I'm not submitting it with any other French ingredients. So we're up to nine. Moving on to mozzarella, we get another two. And while I can use this ability to trash a card, I'm going to choose not to for now. Abilities are always optional and activate in whatever order you choose. So we're up to 11 meal points. Moving on to the tomato, which is three more, plus an additional two because our baguette is a carb. Whenever you see a little asterisk in a meal point value, that means that the bonus amount could be variable. Next, we're up to 16 meal points. The garlic will give us another three, but unfortunately, we don't have any spicy flavors in our dish, so we don't get the bonus meal points, which puts us at a grand total of 19 meal points. At this point, we have to declare which judge we'd like to submit to. So let's take a closer look at the judges table. If you'll recall, judges come in three tiers based on the number of meal points needed to submit to them. 15, 18, and 21. Each judge has a base number of medals that they award the player when they score that judge. 15 point judges award two medals, 18 award three, and 21 are worth four. Now, in addition to their base medals, each judge has different tastes and personalities, which can cause them to award bonus medals, or even take away medals, based on the dish submitted to them. For example, little Leonardo here likes protein, so he'll award a bonus medal for each protein ingredient in a dish. Princess Priscilla is a different story. She's kind of a sourpuss, so she'll award a bonus medal for each tart ingredient in a dish. But she hates to eat her veggies, so she'll deduct a medal for each produce ingredient in a dish. Lastly, we have celebrity chef Sammy, who will award two bonus medals for each dairy and acidic pairing in a dish. In addition to awarding medals, each judge also has a special ability printed in the gold band at the bottom of the card. When you successfully score a judge, they leave the judge's table and come to join you on your panel, granting you that ability for the rest of the game. So as you can see, if you score little Leonardo, you gain the ability to buy from the top three cards in the fridge instead of just the top card. If you score Princess Priscilla, she adds bonus meal points to each dish you submit. And if you score Celebrity Chef Sammy, your hand size goes up by one. Now, we have 19 meal points, which means we can currently submit to either Little Leonardo or Princess Priscilla. We do have chicken, a protein in our dish, so Leo would grant us a bonus medal. We don't have any tart ingredients, but we do have a produce, so Priscilla wouldn't be a good choice for us right now. But you know what? We do have the acidic and dairy combo that Chef Sammy is looking for. So let's go back to our dish and see if there's anything we can do to score her. Looking at my hand, I still have my last finishing salt, which by itself is only worth one meal point. But it has this on submit ability, which allows me to discard cards from my hand to gain additional meal points. So what I'm going to do is discard a tasting spoon from my hand and add a final bam of finishing salt to my dish to bring it all the way up to 21 meal points and submit to Celebrity Chef Sammy. Now, before we score Sammy, we get to do my favorite part of the game. We get to describe our dish. So looking at the ingredients I have here, I think what I'm going to do is grill the chicken, slice up and toast the baguette, dice together the tomato and the garlic, put it all together, top with mozzarella, and finish with a pinch of salt to make chicken bruschetta. 
So now we take Chef Sammy and she eats all of our ingredients. We'll stick all the ingredients under her and set her next to our deck here. Next we draw the metal tokens that we scored and because we had that awesome tomato and mozzarella combo, Sammy grants us a whopping six medals. Now there's a vacancy at the judges table, so let's turn over our next judge. Chef Sammy is replaced by Paleo Pete. At this point, my submission turn is over. I draw up to six new cards because of Sammy's ability, and we cycle the marketplace just like a normal turn. So, as you can start to see, because the ingredients submitted to a judge are lost, you'll want to balance your short-term strategy of what ingredients do I need to buy to make my dish with your long-term strategy of what judges do I want to score to make me the strongest chef at the table. And with my turn done, my opponent would take their turn and play continues back and forth until a player has reached a certain number of medals. In a two-player game, play continues to 15 medals. In a three and four-player game, you play to 10. At the end of the game, whoever has the most medals is the winner. In the case of a tie, look under your judges and count the ingredients. Whoever has used the most ingredients is the winner. If there's still a tie, well, you're just going to have to agree to share the victory or play again. Well, I think that about wraps it up. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you enjoy playing Cuisine a la Carte. If you have any questions or want to order a copy, please visit us at www.inmotiongames.com cuisine. From all of us at InMotion Games, thanks for watching and bon appetit. <laughs>